Well, uh, we began a, a couple of weeks ago and kind of laid the background and all the foundation for our study in Acts and all the historical information about Luke and so forth. And I uh, encourage you to get that CD and, uh, and go through it. I think it's uh, helpful for us. Last week, then, we really got started in the first couple of verses and certainly in our key verse for the book, which helps us outline the book in chapter 1, verse 8. But the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the innermost parts of the world. And that pretty much tracks the outline of the book. We've said uh, it's a key verse because without the power of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to be able to be the witnesses he wants us to be. Uh, we've also said that uh, uh, some people look at the book of Acts and see it as simply a, a church in transition that we can learn a few things from. It is a church in transition, and we talked about some of those transitions from being primarily Jewish uh, to Gentile, uh, and uh, by the time we get to the end from the transition from Jerusalem to Antioch, Syria, in terms of the headquarters of the church, a church in transition. But we said it's much more than that. It's a model. It's a model that we follow. It teaches us about church, how to do church, how to share our faith with, uh, with other people, how to pray, the importance of prayer, and so many other subjects. Uh, it's really a model for us, and we're going to begin to see that this morning. Uh, here we're going to see... Uh, in this uh, early chapter, uh, four essential ingredients uh, for a church that's powerful. Uh, here's a church that, well, there's uh, at one time 500 people saw the resurrected Lord, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians. There's uh, at least 500 believers, but the ones we're going to focus on this morning are about 120 in an upper room. Uh, and we know from this small nucleus of people following these four essential things in their generation, well, the critics said, they turned the world upside down with the preaching of Jesus Christ. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the point here is that uh, if we want to do the same, we just follow the example. Uh, it's, not, it's not rocket science, uh, and it's laid out pretty clearly uh, for us. Well, let's look at the first essential, and it's they continued in, uh, in unity. That's in verse 12. Uh, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, the Shabbat, or a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room uh, where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, the son of James. These all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, uh, the Mary, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brother. So uh, the first thing, they continued in unity despite their circumstances. Again, they're returning to Jerusalem, Mount of Olives, uh, within a... Sabbath day's walk because the mission has said you couldn't walk more than two-thirds of a mile uh, on a day and so they're uh, able to head back. Uh, our point here is that it's the upper room. There's a pronoun there. It's not a upper room. It's where they've been. It's where Jesus taught in John 14, 15, 16, what we call the upper room discord. They're going to go back to the upper room as instructed by Jesus to wait for the Holy Spirit in the same place where they, well, they actually got the teaching about the Holy Spirit from uh, Jesus himself. We highlighted just a portion of that last week in John 14, 16. There Jesus says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, uh, and that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but uh, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And so there, knowing the Holy Spirit is with them. Uh, John 20, the Holy Spirit is in them. As Jesus breathes on them, they receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, they are waiting now for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. Uh, we've been in uh, a room that's to the traditional site in Jerusalem of this event, whether it's in that room or not, we don't really know. Uh, but it does give you a sense that uh, it doesn't take too big of a room to hold 120 people. And they did have them built on the housetops uh, there in Jerusalem in the first century. Uh, and so we've got 120 people here uh, waiting on the Holy Spirit. Now think about their being in this room at the time of, uh, of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Uh, they are uh, waiting there uh, behind locked doors, very much afraid. And of course, then Jesus finally uh, through many appearances, convinces him uh, of his resurrection. Uh, that's the game changer. Uh, and they are uh, with him for a period of uh, 40 days and so forth as he, we would say, steps in and out of the time-space continuum 
uh, and uh, is able to just show up whether they're on a beach in Galilee or right through uh, into a, a room that's locked and reveal himself to them. That's been going on for a period of time. They've gone from being afraid to a group of uh, men and women that are filled with joy. We'll actually read that uh, from Luke's Gospel uh, in a moment. Uh, a great transition uh, despite uh, uh, the uh, diversity of the group here uh, because they've seen the resurrected Lord and they're excited. They're excited uh, because uh, Jesus is going to send the Holy Spirit. Uh, and the second thing we don't want to uh, highlight that a little bit, several names are getting given here. Uh, there is a great unity. Uh, we've got Mary, who is the mother of Jesus, uh, that's here. Uh, this is the last time she's mentioned uh, in Scripture, so that's kind of interesting to note. Uh, and we point out the fact that Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, right along with everybody else, was waiting for the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> she needed the Holy Spirit to come upon her. Uh, and certainly, uh, I'm sure she was highly esteemed and honored being the earthly mother of Jesus uh, in this crowd. Uh, but from her own lips, uh, she confessed earlier in the wonderful poem and song that she probably sang about Jesus being born that she needed a Savior as well. That's in Luke's Gospel as well, Luke uh, 146. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. We just point out, because it's kind of contradictory to some traditional teachings, Mary needed Jesus. She needed to be saved. She needed a Savior, and she needed the Holy Spirit. The brothers of Jesus were there as well. John 7, uh, verse 2, talks about the fact that, well, there, there, there were the cynics uh, of Jesus. These are his, uh, again, uh, earthly, what we might say, stepbrothers and so forth, the other children of, uh, of Joseph uh, and Mary. Uh, after his, uh, he was virgin born, uh, and they were pretty critical. Uh, at one point in time, uh, basically insinuating they thought Jesus was a bit crazy uh, for these uh, messianic ideas that he has and so forth. And, uh, and here we get a little bit of a, a light of that in John 7, 2, where he says, Now the, the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers, therefore, said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe him. So they're, they're sarcastic. They're saying, hey, you're the big shot, Messiah. Why don't you go to Jerusalem? Why don't you let people see what you're doing down there? Because we don't believe you. That, that's the idea. But they're there now. They're there now. And, uh, because they've seen, they've seen Jesus uh, after the resurrection. And we, and we even have Jesus coming to James uh, in particular uh, and having a conversation with him and ministering to him. And, of course, James goes on and he becomes the head of the church in Jerusalem. We have his epistle and uh, he becomes a, a man that was known as James the Just because uh, he spent so much time in prayer and uh, becomes a, a tremendous leader of the early church. But they've seen the resurrected Lord. There are women there, the typical women that were around or mentioned in the Gospels. Mary Magdalene, Mary of Clopas, Susanna, <laughs> Joanna, Mary of Bethany, uh, and Martha. If there was a kitchen in that upper room, she may have been there as well. But uh, a diverse group, uh, group of people. Then you've got the disciples themselves. Everything from Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, to uh, uh, so, you know the, the ones that were zealots and wanted to take uh, over by force and so forth. You couldn't get a more diverse group of people, uh, but they are there in unity. And they're there, we say thirdly, because they're in preparation for the coming of the Spirit. Uh, again, when we think about his interaction with the disciples, we have a, a few of those uh, episodes for us when he appears again on the Sea of Galilee and the guys are supposed to be waiting on him, but they've gone back fishing and so forth. Uh, any questions, Peter, how much do you love me? We have a very interesting situation after his resurrection of two men walking on the road to the town of Emmaus. Jesus appears to them in his resurrected form. They don't necessarily recognize him. Of course, they're in, they're in uh, tremendous uh, uh, depression, distraught. And Jesus, of course, uh, has a little fun with them. And uh, why, why are you guys looking so bummed out here? Uh, don't you, don't have you heard the news? You know, and they kind of go on. And eventually, he reveals and uh, himself shares the scriptures with them, and they said, did, our, did not our hearts burn within us? Uh, and this interaction of Jesus revealing the scripture and ministering to people over this period of time, uh, they're able to come together in this upper room, this diverse group of people, 
because as it says in verse 14, they all continued uh, in one accord. And that's, that's not a Honda. That's in a reference to the fact that they uh, have unity. It also indicates that when they prayed, they prayed passionately. Paul uses the same term in Romans 15, 5, where he says, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you, grant you to be like-minded uh, towards one another. That's our word in the Greek, to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God and Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7 goes on, says, Therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. They have unity because they received one another. Uh, there was no more competition. This is the thing you know, think about the disciples, and uh, uh, we have this conversation around the dinner table sometimes as uh, our grandkids jockey for position uh, to who gets to sit next to grand, you know, Kathy and, uh, and all that's going on. Uh, I know none of your kids or grandkids do that, but uh, uh, ours do. And uh, I'm also often reminded uh, of the apostles. They pretty much did the same thing at every meal. Uh, but we don't see that going on anymore. They receive one another. Uh, a couple of things about this. The Lord's family didn't claim any special recognition. Peter wasn't criticized for his denial. Peter didn't blame John for getting him into the high priest's house. And, and he's the one that caused all. You don't have that going on. John didn't brag about being the only apostle that was faithful to the end was there at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. Nobody's asking who's the greatest and nobody's asking who sinned the most. It's, it's all gone. Uh, they're in one accord. A phrase that's found six times uh, in the book of Acts. Or in words, he says it was a time for praying together and standing together uh, in the Lord. Uh, and of course, this is what Jesus prayed for them uh, so often. One of those prayers is in uh, John 17, where Jesus says, I and them and you and me, uh, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. The NIV puts it this way. I like its rendering. Uh, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me even as you have loved, uh, as you have loved me. In other words, the essential ingredient to men and women and children coming to faith in Jesus Christ is that the church, the local church, there's got to be unity. Uh, it can't be who's the greatest or who's in the most. Uh, it can't be any of those things because we are the representation of Jesus in his own relationship with the Father. Uh, as, as the Father has loved Jesus, so we are to love one another. They did it. They received one another. And you couldn't get a more diverse group of people uh, in a room uh, in that upper room than was this group of people. And they stayed together for one reason. They believed the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them. Uh, they expected it. There was no wavering. There was no discussion. Uh, there was no debating. And these are Jewish people. And there's, <laughs> there's, no, there's no debating. I don't know if you understand that. If you've got two Jewish guys, you've got three opinions. You know, and uh, uh, it's, it's not an easy deal. But here they are. Uh, they are completely unified as one. Church that experiences God's power will continue in unity. Secondly, in verse 14, and we've already read, they're constant in prayer. Uh, there it says again, uh, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So they continued, we would say, to pray and praise together. Uh, there the words and supplication are not actually in the Greek text. The translators are kind of adding that in to help us understand uh, possibly what was going on. Because the word for prayer is the word for worship. So certainly the emphasis here is on worship. Uh, they were there in the upper room and they were worshiping together. Uh, they were certainly probably also, supplication is the word, means where we bring our needs and our concerns before the Lord. And I'm sure they did that as well. But the emphasis here is on worship, uh, and they're very persistent about it, and prayer plays a key role. No church will ever be powerful for the kingdom of God without prayer, without consistent and constant prayer. Uh, and certainly, we'll see that throughout the book of Acts. Prayer was a normal part of their ministry. Stephen prayed uh, before he was stoned, the first martyr of the church in Acts 7. Peter and John prayed for the Samaritans in Acts 8. Saul of Tarsus prayed after his conversion in chapter 9. Peter prayed before he raised Dorcas from the dead in chapter 9. 
Cornelius prayed that someone would come and tell him how to be saved. Peter was on a rooftop and prayed uh, that the Lord would show him what he wants him to do next in terms of sharing the gospel, and he ends up at Cornelius' house. The believers in John Mark's house prayed for Peter when he was in prison, and the Lord delivered him uh, from prison and from death. The church at Antioch fasted and prayed before they sent out Paul and Barnabas, chapter 13. Uh, and in Philippi, uh, Peter, uh, excuse me, Paul prayed for a young woman named Lydia, who becomes the first convert uh, there in southern Europe. Uh, there was another pre prayer meeting in Philippi, and prison doors were opened, uh, and the result was the prison jailer who was in charge was saved, he and his family. Paul Freed prayed for his friends before leaving them in Acts 20. In the midst of a storm on a ship, he prayed for God's blessing. After the storm, he prayed and a man was sick. A.T. Robinson said, they stuck to praying. Uh, they were constant. They were continuing in praying. And, you know, we, we could give you know, a whole message just on prayer. And, uh, and I could do it in such a way is that, uh, you, you know, everybody would, could go out of the room feeling pretty good. Yeah, I don't think anybody thinks, think, think I'm praying a little too much. You know, I've got to cut, cut back, do your resolution, way too much time. You know, we, you know, we, we know that's almost impossible. You know, our, our, our problem is actually the, the opposite. You know, we can hear this, we can realize it, uh, it all makes sense, uh, and we can start out to do it, but the problem is we kind of drop off. You know, if every time we pray for somebody, they came to faith in Christ, we, within a week or so, we'd probably pray a lot, maybe all the time. And, uh, uh, but it just doesn't. We have to be persistent uh, in, uh, in our prayers. And uh, that's what Jesus taught in Luke 24. Uh, there, uh, in the final account of the gospel, we have this uh, uh, situation with him. And, and the focus here, again, on worship and what was going on. It says, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, uh, when he blessed them, that he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Again, parallel to our opening chapter. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually, here's that, that same kind of idea, persistence, continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Uh, amen. So they were, were they locked away in the upper room for uh, 10 days, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come? No. Uh, they were out. Uh, they were in the city. They were in the temple. Uh, they were in the temple, again, worshiping and praising God continually. The point is they were persistent in it. There was a unity uh, that allowed them to be constant in prayer and in worship. And we see a similar statement in the following chapter in Acts 2.42. 2, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in the Bible, fellowship, breaking of bread, uh, in, in prayers. But I mentioned our problem is just not being persistent. Uh, over in Luke's gospel, uh, Jesus tells a parable about this to help us understand the, uh, the, the need to be persistent in prayer. Uh, there in verse 1 he says, Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Because that's what we do. We should always pray. Our problem is we lose heart, uh, according to, uh, to Jesus. Why do we lose heart? We don't always see results right away. You know, it's, it's like the, uh, you know, the gal that's, uh, you know, distraught because she's been praying for six months for her husband to get saved until she talks to the lady next to her who prayed for 30 before hers got saved. You know, we just, you know, we, it, it's easy to get going, but uh, according to Jesus, uh, we, uh, we kind of lose heart. And, uh, and the point here is they were constant, continuing in prayer. So Jesus tells a story to help us understand he says, there was a certain city, and a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Not a nice guy. <laughs> there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, uh, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wears me out. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So Jesus is saying there's a woman. Uh, she's got a concern. She's not getting justice over something. She's going to the judge. The judge could care less. But the judge says, this lady is driving me nuts because she keeps coming day and night, day and night. I don't really care about her or anybody else, but I'm going to hear her case and make sure she gets justice because of her persistence. 
Now that's in the, the emphasis here is on an unjust judge. So Jesus says, how much more your heavenly father, who is a just and a loving God, will not give you what you want or hear your prayers if you don't lose heart, if you're persistent. Does, it, does, it, does God want us to keep coming to him over and over and over again? Apparently, apparently. Because in our prayers, of course, we're praying and trying to seek his will. Often in prayer, I find that my prayer changes. Uh, because uh, prayer is not designed to get my will done. It's designed to get his will done. But we need to be persistent. That's the point of the story. And, of course, the uh, remark at the end, he says, uh, will he really find faith on the earth? What kind of faith? The kind of faith that perseveres in prayers. That doesn't just pray for something for a day or a week uh, or a month or, or even a year, uh, but will be consistent uh, in prayer. This is a group of people that had, uh, had unity together uh, because uh, they had a huge undertaking. This little thing called the evangelization of the world was before them, uh, and they were had unity uh, and they were persistent in prayer. Uh, they did not uh, give up. And by the time we get to the end of uh, chapter 4, uh, it says that they were one in heart and mind, and the result was much grace and great power came upon them. Secondly, they were consistent in prayer because of a great need. This is very important. Is it, they knew something. They knew something. They understood something that we all need to understand as well, which plays into why they had unity and why they were co so consistent uh, in prayer. Uh, and uh, I'll illustrate it by kind of a classic story. There was a great Bible teacher of his generation named William R. Newell. He was speaking in China at that time at the China Inland Missions Conference. Uh, and as he was, uh, completed his uh, speaking and preaching there, he said to the director, pray for me that I shall be nothing. And the director <laughs> said, Newell, you are nothing. Take it by faith. Uh, that's what they do. See, this group of men and women in this upper room, they knew they were nothing. They knew they were nothing. Apart from the Lord, evangelization of the world, how could they possibly do They were nothing. But they knew that uh, in faith in God, something tremendous could happen. God was going to be sending the Holy Spirit. Uh, and they were unified together because there was no one-upmanship. There was no, I wasn't the one that denied him, you did. There was no who was the greatest. Hey, we, are, we grew up with them. Uh, none, none of that was going on because they were nothing <coughs> in this time. Uh, they received one another as they were. That's important. But in their own eyes, they saw themselves as, uh, as really nothing. Uh, and that brought a tremendous unity. Uh, and they knew that, man, they needed to be in prayer on a very consistent basis. That's our first, first two elements. Uh, the third one is they were carefully directed by the word and we see that in verses 15 to 20. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. And said, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with his wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle with all of his entrails uh, gushed out. We say too much information. Uh, and it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akel Dama, which is field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, and don't let no one live in it, and let another take his office. So, uh, there's uh, a couple of things going on here that are very important for us uh, to understand uh, and pretty essential and pretty basic uh, to our Christian life, uh, much less uh, a church that will move in power. Uh, first, we'd say that they were, they were directed in this first big decision. Uh, Peter gets up and explains what's happened. Keep in mind, Jesus was betrayed by Judas, but they were as well. I mean, he's, he's, one, of the, he's one of the boys. I mean, they might have uh, fought with each other over who was the greatest and, uh, and so forth all the time. Uh, but there weren't a lot of fighting with uh, Judas. Judas was the good guy. It's like, who should keep the money? Uh, give it to Judas, man. That guy's straight as an arrow. You know, I mean, it's like, don't give it to Peter. You don't know what he might do with it, but uh, Judas is okay. They kind of looked up to the guy. Yeah, I mean, is that pretty clear to everybody? The, the guy you give the money to, you have a lot of confidence in. You don't give it to the guy. He'll probably betray us. Give it to him. No, they didn't do it. They think he's a really great guy. 
And then he ends up being the betrayer. When Jesus announces that someone's going to betray me, they're all going, oh, it's not me. I mean, you know, these are, the, these are the, the disciples. These are the apostles before, you know, Jesus' death and resurrection, before uh, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, they were just as betrayed uh, by him, is, is, my, is my point. Uh, and there, obviously, uh, there's a lot that's transpired, uh, and they're distraught uh, over this. Uh, but Peter then rises to the occasion uh, and begins to explain what has transpired. He refers to Scripture to help him understand what's, what's happened. Now, when he does, he makes reference and gives a slightly different account than Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Matthew's Gospel just says that uh, uh, Judas, after he betrayed Jesus, came back to the temple, threw the money that he had gotten, the 30 pieces of silver, uh, in the temple. The priest said they didn't want to take it because it's blood money. Uh, Judas walks out and he hangs himself. Here we have a few more details which helps understand uh, why it's called a field of blood because they can't use the money so they take Judas's money, they purchase the field uh, and it's called a field of blood. Did Judas literally buy the field? No, but his money was used to, to buy it. No, no real contradiction there. Uh, but Peter is looking at their situation uh, in the context of scripture. Uh, and they have a, seem to have a new ability. Again, the apostles didn't seem to be too swift about putting things together uh, before this time. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, during this 40-day period, uh, there's probably many incidents like the incident with the two guys in the Maus Road, uh, which in that case, uh, it says in Luke 24, 45 of Jesus, he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Peter seems to have a new understanding of the scriptures. Uh, Peter is able to now grasp and look at scripture and go, uh, here's, there's something terrible that's happened in our lives. What does the Bible have to say about it? Well, here's a scripture that helps us understand. Well, what should we do? Well, here's a scripture that actually tells us what to do. This, we all need to do this, right? This is, this is why we study the Bible. We need to have this ability. Uh, to be able to look at life situations and be able to say, what, well, why is this happening? What is going on? Well, you know what the Bible has this to say about that situation. Uh, what do I do now? Well, you know what? The Bible actually gives me some direction in this situation. Uh, this early church is moving powerfully because they carefully are being followed and directed uh, by, by the word of God. Uh, where did they get this? Well, from Jesus, of course. And we've got one of those examples in John 13, and it pertains to Judas, our same subject matter. There in John 13, verse 18, Jesus says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled, and that Jesus quotes scripture. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. He's referring to Judas. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass that you may believe that I am he. Most surely I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom uh, he spoke. So here Jesus is saying, there's something terrible that's going to happen. Someone is going to betray me. Here is a scripture that applies to our situation, and he quotes Psalm 49.1. In that case, in the historical case, David is writing, and he's writing about a man named Ahithophel. Ahithophel was one of his close counselors. It was one of his advisors. And when David's son, you remember Absalom, rebelled against him, tried, tried to take the throne uh, and, uh, and so forth, uh, and, and leads basically a civil war there in Israel against his own father, David's trusted advisor, a man named Ahithophel, betrays him and goes with his son Absalom. And he writes about it in Psalm 49. Jesus, when he's introducing the idea is that someone is going to betray me and it's going to be one of you, it's like this in the scripture. And then he quotes the scripture. This is happening in our lives right now. Uh, has that happened before in scripture? Yes, it's happened before in scripture. Uh, it's not uh, an anomaly. These things happen uh, in our lives. Boy, this seems like such a difficult trial. Well, James says, you know, to be, uh, that we should rejoice in trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces perseverance. 
And perseverance must finish its work so that we can be complete and mature. Uh, and, uh, and the Bible has a lot to say about the difficulties of life. What's happening, how it's happening, why we're going through it. And we need to be able to, like they did, like Jesus did, like Peter is doing now, look into the scriptures and say, man, what, what is going on here? Does the Bible have anything to say to me about this situation? And then does it direct me uh, as to what to do uh, next? And that's exactly what uh, we have going on here. Uh, as we pray and try to seek God's will, it's important that we have this basic understanding of God's will. Uh, it will help us tremendously. John, writing later in 1 John 5, 14, says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. John is saying, if we pray, if we could do this, how could, we, how could we know we're praying according to his will? If we pray according to the Bible. <laughs> God is already smoking, and we pray something in agreement with what he's already said. We can know that we're praying according to God's will. And John says if we know that we're praying according to his will, we know he hears us. We know that he hears us. We know that we've, well, it's a, kind of a done deal. God's going to hear us. It's going to happen. We just need to be, be praying prayers that are really full of the Bible so that we can know and understand a real Christian worldview so we can be praying according to God's will. There's a lot of times we don't know, right? There's times we're praying us or we're praying along and Lord, man, I don't know if this is your will or not, but you know, I just kind of submit it to you. Uh, but when we can pray according to God's will, uh, it's huge. And we really can't do that if we don't have this ability, a, a, a basic grasp, I'm not talking about theological degree, but a basic understanding of Scripture and familiarity with it so that when we're praying, we can think about and God, the Holy Spirit, can bring to our hearts and minds Scripture. Here's a verse that applies to your situation. Uh, here's another verse that applies to your situation. We can be praying in God's will. This is what they were doing. This is a church that moved powerfully because there was a tremendous unity. Why? Because they all knew they were nothing. That, that's why. Uh, and they were, they were praying with a focus on worship, a focus on worship, uh, so that when they sang those songs, it wasn't Christian karaoke. It was, those words are my heart. I'm saying that because I'm saying that to God. He's here. He hears me. He enthrones the praises of his people. I sense his presence, and I can express my love for him. I'm not too good with words, so I'm going to sing Mark's words or whatever we got here. That's my expression of love. You know what happens when you do that? Other people come in and they catch it. Wow, these guys are serious. I think they believe what they're saying there. They keep acting like God is right here and he is present. Uh, I better get serious about this. It, it's interesting what happens. When a group of people really do that and worship and other people come in, well, that's the way it was for Kathy and I. We just go, wow. <laughs> I mean, we went to churches and they sang three hymns out of the hymnal. It's like, okay, set that down and take a seat, and then we get a sermon for a Christian at and try to get home before the rose burns. You know, and, uh, but this was all different to us when we first started going. Was there a lot of people? Yeah, there was almost 25 of them. It was awesome. Oh, did, you mean it doesn't take a lot of people? No, it doesn't take a lot of people. It just takes people that, are, that believe what they're doing in terms of worship, and, and certainly prayer and praise. But this is a church that we're going to follow in, in their footsteps and God uses them in a powerful way. There is no reason why he doesn't want to just continue to do that with succeeding generations. That's why he's left us the book of Acts. Uh, the unity, because they knew they were nothing. Uh, they were able to focus on prayer and praise consistently. Uh, and they're very careful to be directed uh, by, by the word of God. <clears throat> About a year or so ago, I had an insurance agent, our guy, you know, sitting in here, kind of doing our little annual review and what's going on and stuff. And then we got to the end, and he said, um, he says, hey, do you, uh, uh, do you do any counseling? And uh, the reason he's asking me that question, he wanted to know if I needed liability insurance for it. Because there's actually been lawsuits where a pastor or someone on staff counsels somebody, uh, and uh, whatever's going on with them emotionally, you know, kind of, uh, doesn't go well, uh, and then you've got non-safe family members that uh, seek retribution uh, from, from the church. So I, I had to actually offer, offer liability insurance for counseling. Uh, but I, I said to him, I said, no, actually, I, I don't do any counseling. I said, I got two degrees. 
uh, an advanced degree. They're both in, uh, in biblical studies. I don't do any counseling. Uh, I go, what, what I do do is uh, I'm happy to meet with people from the church, kind of listen to their situation, what's going on in their lives, and the very best that I can. Then I take the Bible and we try to apply the Bible to their, their situation so we can see what God's will is and what, the, you know, even if we can't change the circumstances, what our attitudes ought to be, and, then, and we pray together. But uh, no, I don't do any counseling. He said, it's like the best answer I've ever heard. Just keep saying that. You don't need the insurance. <laughs> and, and we don't. I mean, we don't do counseling per se. Uh, we try to look at the Bible and see what the Bible says in regards to our lives and our situations. So we can take comfort in it. I'm not the only guy that's going through this, apparently. There is no temptation that, uh, that is not common to man. That means we're kind of all in this together. I thought it was just me thinking this. Whatever it is, you know, the Bible can minister to us. But, of course, we've got to be in the Bible. We've got to be studying the Bible. In the same way, we place such a high priority upon it. Uh, they were continued in unity, constant in prayer, carefully directed by the word, uh, and then they're going to choose a uh, new leadership. They got together, verse 21, they had a big vote, they polled all the people, checks and marketing detail. Actually, it doesn't say that, does it? Yeah. It says, therefore, all of these men who accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, uh, beginning with the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and, uh, and uh, Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show us of these two uh, you have chosen to take part in this ministry, apostleship from Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And again, sometimes uh, it's asked, was it wrong for them to choose a new apostle at this point? Uh, because after all, we know that the apostle Paul comes along later. Wasn't he the 12th apostle? Well, uh, I don't think so. I think it was right for them to choose a new leader. That's what they were doing. Hey, something terrible has happened. We've been betrayed by Judas. What does the scripture say? Well, hey, there was a betrayer that Jesus spoke about. There was a betrayer in the Psalms that... Uh, uh, comes to mind now. And, well, what should we do then? Well, we should choose another to take his place. Uh, they're being directed by, by the word of God. But notice what they do do. They come up with a criteria. He has to have been a partaker of John's baptism. He had to sit under the teaching of Jesus. And he had to have been of, uh, uh, a witness of the resurrection. Uh, the apostle Paul doesn't make uh, meet any of those qualifications. Not only that, uh, the first time the Apostle Paul shows up in Jerusalem, they don't even want to talk to him. <clears throat> this is like, uh, like you're in Iran, and you're in a house church. A lot, a lot of Christians in Iran. And a guy named Abdenajad gets saved. And he, this guy wants to bring him to the Bible study. Uh, I'm, I'm not too sure about that. You know, may, you know, just kind of keep your eye on him for a while. That's the Apostle Paul, right? He's the persecutor of the church. Uh, not only was he not one of the twelve, uh, they didn't want to talk to him. And, uh, and if it wasn't for uh, a guy named Barnabas to come along and go, listen, this guy's really all right, man. He's, he is totally saved. You know, it's, in fact, uh, we're going to give him another name, call him Paul, just so that name Saul doesn't freak everybody out all the time. And uh, it took a while. But Paul, Paul is not the 12th apostle. Uh, there are many apostles in the book of Acts. That's why we see there were 12 apostles, and everybody else was a B apostle. Uh, but they're, they're still in there. But... Uh, uh, they choose a new guy, uh, and important for us to see that. But I want to uh, focus on the process here. Notice the, the steps that they took, because <clears throat> this can help us very practically. They went to the Word, as, uh, as we've been talking about. They looked at the circumstances of their life and said, what does the Bible say about this? Are there times that in your particular situation there's no chapter and verse? You know, there might be. But there's lots of things uh, that the Bible speaks to us. And certainly is anything having to do with relationships, uh, our finances, our kids, our concerns and hopes for the future, uh, lots of things, integrity of heart, honesty and uh, business. I mean, there's a lot of things the Bible covers. Uh, you know, it may not uh, help you with your doctor, it may not help you with your lawyer, but uh, uh, and those kind of, it doesn't, no help there on plumbing. Go to YouTube and just type it in. That's, but... Uh, uh, these issues uh, of life 
that are important to us, we go to the Word. Uh, and then they develop a logical criteria to follow. Uh, they go, okay, well, yeah, uh, the Word says we should replace him. Uh, well, uh, what do you think? Well, it's got to be somebody that's been with us from the beginning. Yeah, how far back? John's, John. John's baptism? Okay. Uh, what else? Well, they, they got to have heard the teaching of Jesus. I don't know how they can be one of us, 12, to take the gospel to the 12 tribes of Israel uh, unless they are familiar with the teachings of, of Jesus. Okay. What else? They better have seen the resurrected Lord and they're not going to last long. Think of, think of like what a bunch of bumbling idiots we were until we actually saw the resurrected Lord. So it better be all three of those things. Okay. What should we do now? Let's pray. <laughs> we got a couple of guys that meet that criteria. Which one is it? I don't know, man. Let's just pray. But that's the criteria. Uh, they, they go to the Word and says, how does this apply to my situation? There is a logical discussion that followed that. And then they went and prayed for the Lord's leading. Uh, and that's what it says in verse 24. Uh, again, uh, what they did next needs a little explaining because they use a, a means to determine God's will that's not available to us, and that is the, the idea of casting lots. Casting lots was simply uh, something that was used throughout the Old Testament, and this is the last time we see it in the New Testament. Basically, you had a little clay jar. <laughs> you had a couple of rocks inside. One's black, one's white. One mid yes, one mid no. <laughs> Give me a yes. <laughs> You know, no, they, they uh, you know, that, yeah, that's basically what they did, though. And they say, well, would that work for me? Because there's this other little game I know about. No, it's not the same thing. <laughs> right? It's not the same thing. Uh, uh, it worked for them because the Proverbs 16.33 says, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Uh, it was used commonly. The high priest, once a year on the Day of Atonement, uh, would have a decision to make. He's got two goats in front of him. One is going to be the scapegoat, and it's going to be set free in the wilderness. Uh, the other one is going to be sacrificed. He didn't go any, many, mighty mo. He actually cast a lot, and that's how he determined it. Uh, Saul cast lots, uh, trying to deal with the Philistines and what God wanted him to do. Uh, Joshua cast a lot to determine where the sin in the camp was after the defeat uh, of, uh, of Ai. And we could go on and on. Common in the Old Testament, we don't find it uh, in the New Testament because uh, we have the completed word of the New Testament, the scriptures, uh, and certainly we have the Holy Spirit uh, in us. Uh, why did it work for them? Well, verse 24, then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart, show us. So we don't need to cast lots. Uh, we, we can just pray that same thing. Lord, you know everyone's heart show us. You know, there's lots of times when something's going on and we can't find a chapter and verse to correlate, but you know, there's a lot of times we can and we're just not looking. And the Lord wants to direct us from his word. With, with that, he also wants to direct us by his spirit. We've talked a lot about that uh, as, uh, as well. But that's what they did. They went to the word, they developed a criteria, they discussed it, uh, and then uh, they, they prayed. And I did uh, ask uh, Eddie if I could tell a little story this week. We were just sharing uh, during the week, uh, and uh, Eddie at work uh, had a situation come up recently uh, that maybe helped illustrate this. <clears throat> There's a woman that comes into uh, to work, very, very distraught, uh, very emotional and everything. Uh, he does his best. He's at work, trying to minister in a few minutes and try to point her to Jesus, and that's what she needs. <laughs> is there a scripture verse to that? People that are downcast and distressed and so forth. And they, yeah, there's lots of verses we could go to. That was the right thing to do to direct her to the Lord. Uh, but then, man, he's on the clock, so he's got to be about his business. Uh, he cannot, while he's working, pray with her. It doesn't mean he can't pray for her. And so he kept praying for her. And then, uh, and then a little while, uh, his cousin uh, comes in, who's a believer. Hey, uh, just. Thought I'd come see you. You know, I felt led by the Holy Spirit. Come see you. Really? Great. See that lady back there? Uh, she needs someone to uh, talk to her about the Lord. I've been shared with her a little. I've been praying with her. Yeah, great. So she goes back and prays with the, basically prays with the gal and leads her to the Lord after a little conversation. Uh, and then Eddie hears the report later. Yeah, the gal was back there, the cousin tells him, and she's praying, maybe that man's right. Maybe that is what I need. Uh, and maybe God loves me. I, I don't know. He's a very nice man. Lord, if you're real, if you're real, 
you send me someone to share me the gospel, someone related to him. So this guy walks up. I'm his cousin. I want to tell you about Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit, right? Nobody scripted that. Uh, that's the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's trying to be directed by the word. And a lot of times there's a chapter and verse. <coughs> Why is this happening to me? And there's a chapter and verse that help me understand my circumstances. I can develop a logical criteria and a plan for my life and what's going on to help me make big decisions. And I can get counsel from other people. And I'll pray, Lord, you know the situation. Lord, show me what to do. And there's other times when, well, kind of that's going on. But also, we don't need to cast a lot. We just say, Lord, you know, show us, show me. And the Lord is faithful to do that if we'll listen. If we'll listen. And his voice will never contradict his word. Again, so we need to be people of the book, people of the word, so we can be directed by the word. This is a church that obviously is powerfully used. And, if, and uh, it's not rocket science. Uh, there's a unity simply because everybody believed they were actually in the final analysis. I know this is going to help your self-esteem, but they were nothing. Nothing apart from the Lord. Man, they needed each other, and they needed prayer, and they needed to be praising God, and declaring their praises and allegiance to him on a pretty, pretty continual basis. And as they did that, then God was able to direct them through the word. In this case, their first big, big decision, directing, choosing someone to take Judas's place. But God wants to do that for each of us every day. Uh, in our lives that we'll simply come to him and trust him. Amen.